Hello YouTube. I will be reading today The Tracker by Tom Brown Jr. I'll be reading this myself to avoid any copyright problems. Um, I've never done this before, but I haven't seen any audiobooks on The Tracker on YouTube, and I really love this book, so I thought I would do it. I might not be perfect at this, or my voice not might not be exactly what you wanted to hear, but this is a free audiobook, so enjoy and I will try my best. I'll be taking breaks here and there, of course, so here we are. <clears throat> Chapter 1, The Ultimate Track The first track is the end of a string. At the far end, a being is moving, a mystery, dropping a hint about itself every so many feet telling you more about itself until you can almost see it, even before you come to it. The mystery reveals itself, slowly, track by track, giving its genealogy early to coax you in. Further on, it will tell you the intimate details of its life and work, until you know the maker of the track like a lifelong friend. The mystery reveals it. <clears throat> sorry. The mystery leaves itself like a trail of breadcrumbs, and by the time your mind has eaten its way to the maker of the track, the mystery is inside you, part of you forever. The tracks of every mystery you have ever swallowed move inside your own tracks, shading them slightly or skewing them with nuances that show you how much more you have become than what you were. Man goes through the world eating his mysteries. I have followed every mystery I could in the 20 years since I became my, began my apprenticeship with an old Apache tracker named Stalking Wolf. I have had no choice in this. Mysteries are irresistible to me, and a trail is something that must be followed until it gives up, gives up its secret or puts me onto the trail of something even more amazing. Tracks fascinate me. I watch my own tracks constantly. They go like a dog with a curious nose, always catching scent of something unidentifiable hovering just out of reach. If I go to the store for milk, my trail winds a quarter of a mile to go a block and a half. Even a small New Jersey town, the landscape is full of invisible animals as a child's puzzle. One winter, <clears throat> after a moderate snow, I went out to get milk and found the track of a small gray bird called a junco. I like the silhouette of the junco. Its head rounds so smoothly into its back that it looks like it ought to be made out of chrome. Birds are always mysteries. They leave their tracks in the air most of the time and I don't have the nose to follow it. The tracks on the ground were irresistible. I crouched down and looked at them, judging the size and shape of the prints to get the type of bird. I watched its ease of movement on the ground and knew it wasn't a finch or a sparrow. The tracks went from seed to seed in an easy zigzagging line. Looking close, I could see where the bird had stopped and leaned a little to one side, breaking down the side of its print while it ducked and then craned its head up. I saw where it gave a little defensive hop as something it seemed threatened must have gone by overhead. The movement from a hop to a better balanced stance said that there had been danger. The way the toes went into the snow and curled under told me that more weight had been forward on the foot as if it, if, as if it had been if the bird were ducking its head and then swiveling it up to look. I had learned what track is made by that gesture the only way it can be learned by watching a similar bird do a similar thing on the ground and then going over to see what the track looked like. By doing this time after time with bird after bird, animal after animal, person after person, I became a tracker. Since I began tracking at the age of eight, I have never seen a track being made without wanting to go over and examine it. With each track, I had a little information to what I have been able to gather so far. Bit by bit, I learned to track more completely the mystery at the end of every track. <clears throat> Excuse me. The tracks painted in the living picture of a bird, a picture indistinct at first but clear with every track until I can see the small, sleek, gray head swiveling, swiveling as he picked up the seed and 
Look for cats, dogs, children, cars, birds after his prize, and a bigger, hungrier things looking for an easy meal. His tracks hop forward and I can see, as I crouched, the brushing of his wings in the snow as he took off. He was gone from the ground, but I could see him in my mind darting through the air. I looked in a straight line for the most pro prominent tree and walked toward it. Juncos do not waste time crushing for bugs or soaring around sightseeing. They live in the pragmatic life of a straight line. They go down to the jaws of sudden death, down into the ground, and live by their wits and their prudence. Birds are a delicacy on most every predator's menu, and when the jungle lands, he hops around watching and watching, pecking and dropping half of what he pecks because his head comes back up so fast to see what's after him. I brushed the pecks and dropped seeds aside. With a mouthful, he had gone flapping off toward the tree, and when I got to it, there were seeds at the foot of the tree that were like the ones that where he had taken off. There was fresh dust of snow around the seeds and beneath some of them where he had knocked snow down off the branch as he landed. He must have felt safe sitting there ten feet above half the things that would have liked to eat him. <laughs> he must have known that he was hard to see in the trees and the hawks would rather take him flying away. A fleeing animal is a vulnerable animal, and every carnivore in the forest likes an easy meal. When he changed the position of the seeds in his gullet, he dropped some of them down over the snow that had fallen from the branch. There were hot marks where he had come down to get the dropped seeds later, but the fact that there was a fine dusting of snow on some of the seeds indicated that he had probably come to the branch before to swallow what he had grabbed from the ground. There were other hot marks under the snow dust when I blew it away, but they seemed to have the same jittery prudence that the other tracks had had. Of course, I knew the bird. I had seen it around my own feeder. <laughs> every species has its own specific, specific behaviors, but every individual performs them differently. They're as unlike as people. <clears throat> I recognized the jittery little tremors, the half steps, thought about every left taken. I had gone out and examined his other tracks after I had watched him one day from my window. I could see him pecking and ducking in that jittery, cocky style of feeding that was as individual as a human gait. I checked how the lighter dust of snow from his takeoff had scattered behind him. I checked where it had fallen in relation to the other, to the other fall and I guessed that Either the wind had been drifting in that direction, or the bird had taken off in the opposite direction, sending the branch back and down at its left and dusting the snow further out than the first fall. Since it was all I had to go on, I went as I had been taught from the track to the trail, looking far ahead to see where it might be going. I could read the identity from the individual print, but I needed the context in which the trail occurred to make sense of its entirety. The bird was feeding, the branch fall indicated that he had flown in the direction of my house, and when I walked back there, I found the same jittery junco near my own feeder. I sat down to watch him, pecking, watching, pecking, watching, pecking, watching, pecking, watching, until someone finally came out of the house and asked me where the milk was. <laughs> I'm going to stop there and continue on part two. Thanks for listening.